chapter 8 deals with hydrologic design methods. The learning objectives for this map module discuss how to calculate and perform hydrologic design based on the rational method. It is important to realize as engineers there's more to hydrology than just analysis. One needs to be able to perform basic hydrologic design and hydraulic design based on the rational method. Examples of design will include but are not limited to sizing roadway gutters, inlets such as curb inlets, catch basins, graded inlets, storm drain, culverts, reservoir outlets which are called risers. The first part is talking about shallow channel design. Shallow channel design is an important aspect of hydrologic design. This method is used for roadway gutters, ditches which are shallow open channels located behind buildings and are slopes, curb section of parking lots, which are key. If you refer to table 8.3 of the McEwen text, this will walk you through some of the shallow channel design. Circular cross sections are very common in designing of gutters behind certain um, buildings. This can be done by using by cutting a corrugated metal pipe. The flow rate is a function of the Manning's roughness, the depth of flow, the slope, and the di diameter of the pipe. Or the circular section. Not only can you calculate the flow rate Q, but you can find the depth of flow in the channel if you knew the flow rate and the diameter. Or, more importantly, the top width of the channel or spread within the circular section based on the diameter and the flow depth. Next, a triangular or trapezoidal section is key. This can represent the gutter on a roadway. The flow rate is a function of Z, the cross slope, N, the Manning's roughness, the S, the longitudinal slope of the road, and D, the depth of flow in the road, not the depth of the curb. T, which is top width is the cross-sectional slope times the depth of flow. In a roadway, T, or top width, is often referred to as spread. You don't want too much water in your roadway, which can cause a car to hydroplane. D, flow depth, can also be calculated by rearranging the flow equation. The third is a V-ditch where flow is, a, is the Manning's equation. All three equations are based on the Manning's equation. They are modified to account for the shape of the particular cr shallow channel. So let's do an example. The transportation design manual tells you that the allowable spread for a two-lane roadway at 45 miles an hour is 6 feet. So 6 feet is the allowable top width. The calculated flow rate is 5 cubic feet per second. The slope of the roadway is 0 0.005 feet per foot. The roadway roughness is 0 0.015. The cross slope, which is z, which is, thir is 30 to 1, is the, accept is the spread within this roadway acceptable or should more drainage inlets be done? The following slide goes over the solution. So pause the video for a moment and try and see if you can calculate the allowable spread. The solution shows that we know the flow rate Q. We know the cross slope Z and the roughness N and we know the slope. We need to measure the depth of the flow. We get 0.38 feet. If we put this into the top width equation, we'll get a top width of 11.4 feet. This is way too high to be acceptable. The acceptable spread on, based on the highway design manual was 6 feet. This spread 
would result in potential damage to vehicles and roadway, and more inlets are necessary. Number two discusses drainage inlets. Drainage inlets are talking about different types of openings. Physical characteristics of grates are under needed, such as the length, the width, the type of inlet. Is it a graded inlet? Is it a curb opening? There are many different types of grates. Roadway design manuals will walk through acceptable graded inlets for your project. There are physical characteristics of the surface. Is the graded inlet located on a concrete surface? Is it located with asphalt? Is it located in a grassy area? Allowable spread based on channel, ch shallow channel design is important to understand so you know how often drainage inlets may be necessary. You need to also understand what return period are you designing for? A two year, a five year, a 10 year, a 25 year? Most roadway projects where drainage inlets are used are usually designed for either a 10 or 25 year storm event based on the type of road and the criteria for that local jurisdiction. The analysis to determine how much flow is entering an inlet is based on both the orifice and the weir equation. If the opening is unsubmerged, then the flow will follow the weir equation, which you learned about in hydraulics, CE332. The weir equation says F times CW times the length times the depth raised to the 1.5 power will give you the flow rate. F represents the interception coefficient. How much of the flow will the curb actually intercept? CW is the weir coefficient, usually assumed to be 3.1. The length is the length of the opening, the perpendicular length, and H is the depth of water going into the opening. Next could be a submerged flow condition where the opening will act like an orifice. Again, We've discussed orifice flow in CE332. In this case, the flow rate, Q, is a function of, the, of CD, the coefficient of discharge, which is usually 0.6, the opening of the orifice, in this case the curb opening, square root of 2 times gravity times the depth of the, depth of the, op of the opening. Now this can be kind of tricky. This depth takes to the center of the opening to the top of the water surface, if you recall. So let's look at an example. You're given an inlet alongside a roadway. Determine the amount of flow intercepted by the inlets. The depth of flow, the depth of the flow H is 0.5. D represents the depth of the opening, and L represents the length of the curb opening. So again, H represents the flow, while D represents how, how high the curb act opening actually is. What I'd like you to do is try and solve case one and case two. In one condition, you have gotten an orifice flow situation, and in another condition, you have a weir flow situation. Pause the video and try and complete the solution. In case one, we've got weir flow. The depth of the opening is less than the depth of the flow. We assume that the coefficient of discharge, CD, is 0 0.6. The area of the opening is 0.4 feet times 15 feet. The height used in the orifice equation is measured to be 0.5, which is the flow depth, minus the midpoint of the actual opening, so 0.4 divided by 2. You will get 15.8 CFS. In case 2, we have weir flow. 
We are going to assume that 100% of the flow is intercepted. This f is 1. The cw, or the weir coefficient, is 3.1. The length is 15. And the depth of flow going over the weir in this example is 0.5 feet. We get 16.4 cubic feet per second. Next, let's talk about a detention basin riser. Risers are the structures which allow flow to leave a reservoir. The equations for the risers are based on both unsubmerged flow, which is the Weir equation, and submerged flow, which is the orifice equation. So let's look at this particular riser, where you have a circular opening that's located little h naught from the bottom of the basin and goes all the way to big H naught. The top of the riser, it's H1. The equations are quite interesting. The flow is equal to zero when the flow depth within the, cha within the reservoir is less than or equal to H naught. As soon as the flow is between H naught and H, little h, you will follow the Weir equation. Next, when the flow is above big H naught, you will follow the orifice equation. And finally, when the flow is above H1, you have a modification of both of the, of the orifice equation to represent the circular opening and you have flow entering the riser from the top, which acts as a weir. I will show what I mean in class, because this is better illustrated through an example, a physical example. Write down the equation so that we can discuss it. Next, let's talk about culvert design. There are, there are three different types of culverts we're going to discuss. The first one is an unsubmerged inlet and outlet. This culvert follows the Manning's equation. And the diameter of the culvert can be determined as 1.33 times the flow rate times the roughness raised to the 3 eighths power times the slope of the culvert to the negative 3 sixteenths. The diameter you get from this equation will tell you what the exact diameter is based on this given flow rate. It is important to realize that whatever diameter you get, you should upsize your pipe to the next available diameter. You cannot buy a 17-inch diameter pipe. You must buy an 18-inch diameter pipe or a 24-inch diameter pipe. The next equation is based on inlet control. It is where you have a submerged inlet, but an unsubmerged outlet. This equation is based on the orifice equation, where Q is the flow rate, D is the diameter of the pipe, H, I is the depth of water ponded above the inlet, invert of the culvert, D again is the diameter, and CD is the coefficient of discharge. Finally, you have an outlet controlled where both your submerged inlet and outlet are submerged. This equation should look quite familiar to you. If you recall from hydraulics, it's taking into account minor losses, such as the entrance of the culvert and the exit of the culvert. It's taking friction losses associated with the length of the culvert, and it's taking into account the change in energy from the entrance to the exit. I will not test you on a submerged inlet and outlet control because in a design standpoint this is very poor design technique. You don't want to have a condition where you submerge both the inlet and outlet. This can cause damage not only to your roadway but it could undermine your culvert. A really good example is taking a design of two equal culverts. I would like you to consider that you're doing a 50-year design for a 45-acre watershed. 
The residential development is 0.5, it has 0.5 acre lots on sea soil. The principal flow path is 200 feet of paved sheet flow with a slope of 0.03. We have 300 feet of flow in a non-vegetated gully and 15,000 feet of flow in a shallow channel. I want to calculate the size of these culverts. Think about this. You first need to calculate the flow rate. We'll do this using the Manning's, I mean, using the rational method. I'm giving you information to calculate travel time so we can find the intensity. And finally, you're given information about the culvert so you can actually design the diameter of the culvert. We will talk about this in class and do this as a class when we meet next. The next section is calculating storage volumes based on the rational method. You have an existing and a proposed condition of flow rates. We are going to convert these into hydrographs. What the image shows is the red line shows the proposed condition hydrograph while the blue shows the existing condition hydrograph. The peak discharge occurs at the travel time. It's a perfectly equilateral triangle. Thus, the flow hits zero at two times the travel time or time of concentration. To calculate the storage volume of this triangular piece, you can simply convert that into a rectangular piece as shown in the next image. The volume of storage is the change in flow rate between the proposed and the existing condition times the tra travel time of the proposed condition divided by the watershed area. This will give you the, p the volume necessary to store the excess water. It is real important to realize that you cannot increase flows going downstream from your project site. Thus, you will need to design detention basins. This analysis allows you to come up with a preliminary design for your watershed. We will do some examples of the storage volume calculations in class.